Hello, my name is Zena Tavares. Today I'm going to talk about running programs forwards, backwards, and everything in between. This is joint work with Javier Baroni, Edgar Manaisan, David Morajon, and Armando Salazano. So what is program inversion? The basic idea is that we have some function or program f and some output y, and we want to find some input x such that f of x is equal to y. Why should we care? Well, we should care because program inversion is really at the core of many different problems, in particular inference and control problems. So for example, the real world is three-dimensional, uh, but what we observe are two-dimensional images. And so we know how to write rendering programs which take input 3D scenes and output 2D images, and we want to invert those rendering functions to find a 3D scene responsible for the image that we are observing. In control, uh, we know how to write a kinematic function which says, given some angles of some robot arm, what is the position of, position of the hand? But what we want to do is to say what angles would allow us to get to some desired target position, that is to invert the kinematic function. So what we're working on is a package called parametricinversion.jl. The basic idea is that you write down a normal Julia function. We can apply that function to some input, but the key thing is that we can use this function inverse invoke, which executes the inverse function on some particular input and some parameters, which I'll describe in a moment. Okay, so the main issue that we have to solve uh, to start with is the non-invertibility of most programs. So even addition is non-invertible because five and one add to six and three and three add to six. So there's some ambiguity that we have to resolve. So my main idea is something I call the parametric inverse. So given some function f from x to y, a parametric inverse is a function which takes in some value y and some parameter theta and outputs some value x. And so the key idea is that if, if a parametric inverse maps y and theta to x, we take the x and then we run it back through the forward function f, we should get out the same y again. And also it should be the case that if we change theta, we should get out, get out some different x, which also maps to y through f. So let me just show you an example. Uh, addition, uh, f of x and y equals x plus y. The inverse of the addition function takes some value z and some parameter theta and produces z minus theta for x and theta for y. The point being that z minus theta add theta is equal to z. And the second point is that if we vary theta, we get out different combinations of x and y, which all sum to z. For the square function, it's a similar story, except that our parameter space is minus one or one to capture the positive or negative root. Okay, so most programs are not simply addition or the square function, they are complicated functions. But the basic idea here is to do this compositionally. And that is, in this example, we have f of x and y equals x plus y squared. We can take the square function and the addition function, and then we can invert these individually and then reverse the order of the composition. Okay, so what does this mean for, for Julia? So the basic idea is that if we have a Julia program, we can do the following procedure. One, go through each statement, invert that statement with this parametric inverse, and then reverse the order of the operations. And if we do this, we get a parametric inverse of the entire complicated Julia program. Okay, so let me go back to the thing I showed you at the start, this inverse invoke method. So the inputs are f, some types to find the method, and then some input x and parameter theta. So the first thing we do is find the method, and then we find the IR, the internal representation of that method. We then apply that transformation that I just told you about to this IR, compile it, and then apply this compiled uh, method inverse method to the inverse inputs and the parameters. So let's look at this example that we've been uh, following so far. We have f2 of x and y equals the square of x plus y. And then in IR form, it's very much the same, it's except that we're in SSA form, so every variable is only defined once. And so here's the inverse IR after the transformation. The key first point is that the input to the inverse uh, the inverse method is the output from the forward method. And then the second thing to note is that we go through each line in reverse order and we are inverting first the square function and then the addition function, as I described uh, a, a moment ago. Okay, so this is a general procedure to invert, you know, arbitrarily complex Julia functions, which should make you skeptical because we know that in general function inversion and program inversion is a hard problem. If it were not, I could just steal all of your Bitcoin quite easily. And so why is it hard? One reason it's hard is this problem which we call partiality. So in this example, we have f of x and y equals x, y plus y. The key point here being that y is used uh, twice, which I'm showing with this duplication function. And so if we follow the procedure that I showed you in the previous slides, we invert the addition function and we invert the multiplication. The problem is that we can get two different values for y which may be inconsistent. In other words, the composite function is a partial function relative to the parameter space. 
Okay, so why does this happen? At a high level, it happens because in the forward direction, everything is deterministic. But in the inverse direction, we have all these parameter choices. And if we choose incorrectly, we can go down a, in some sense, an incorrect branch, a branch which is in some sense impossible. And this is uh, a wrong thing to do. So parametric in, uh, inversion is hard because of this partiality problem. And there's many different ways in which we're trying to solve this. But one way in particular is really making us rethink the entire paradigm. And so the first observation here is that the order in which we execute these statements is somewhat arbitrary or somewhat of a choice. And so I told you that we basically do this in the reverse order, but we actually have some flexibility in which we can do that. And the second observation is that some orderings are better, better than others. And so if you follow the example from the previous slides, uh, again, so here what I'm showing you in red are the things that we know at different stages of, of the inverse execution. So we know at the start the value to the inverse of the to the inverse of the function, the z value. But in the second step, instead of doing the immediate step of inverting the addition function, instead what we're doing here is choosing a value for y, right? So just choosing the value for one of the inputs. And now once you know the value to one of the inputs y and the value of z, actually finding out the value of x is fully deterministic. So in some sense, we've sidestepped the entire problem of partiality uh, just in one, in, in kind of one maneuver. Okay, so let me just show you this in terms of Julia code. So here we have the, the function f, uh, and then we have the inverse function using the naive method that I showed you at the start. And again, the problem here is that we have these two different values of y which are produced by the addition function and the multiplication function, or the inverse of those two functions. And so this is our problem here. And what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here is the fixed version, where the first thing we're doing is choosing a value for y, and then given that and the input uh, to the inverse, we can now just purely deterministically choose through these partial inverses the values for uh, both x and y. And what I mean by partial inverse is that we don't just know the output, we know the output and one of the inputs. So it's a purely deterministic process. Okay, so by doing this process, we actually computed, computed a, a, a complete and sound parametric inverse of this composite function. So what does this mean in a broader sense? So the first principle is that every Julia function defines a mathematical relation over its inputs and outputs. So in this example, uh, we can think about x and y and z as this kind of relation. And a relation is just a set of values or a table. Uh, so we have 3 and 4 and uh, 16 are in the relation. And the next key idea is that uh, given some relation, there's an, kind of an infinite set of different things or queries we might want to ask. And when I use the term query, what I mean is that there are some things that we know and some things that we want to know. And uh, together, these things are a kind of a query, and we want to pass these queries to an engine to compute the answer. So in the first case, we have the normal forward execution, which is that we know the inputs, x and y, and we want the output, uh, z. In the second case, we have the inverse execution, which is that we know z, and we want x and y. But you know, a different case is that we might know uh, the value of x, and we want the values of y and z. Or we might have some more abstract knowledge. So we might know that the output z is in some range, so some interval, 0 to 10, and we want a value for x. Or we might know nothing at all, and we just want a value of x, y, and z, which is consistent with this relation. And so this idea of basically choosing a value uh, which is consistent with the relation defined by our function uh, and the known kind of facts and knowledge that we have and the, the, the variables that we want is kind of the key operation in this framework that we're developing. And so for each one of these queries that I showed you, there's a corresponding expression within our framework uh, using this choose uh, kind of special method. And for each one of these uh, choose methods or choose queries rather, we do a kind of, kind of completely fully automatic program transformation to be able to compute this answer. So with that, I will conclude by saying that Julia functions can be queried in many more ways than the normal forward execution. Uh, computing queries in Julia effectively requires doing these kind of compiler transformations, which is also at the core of things like automatic differentiation. There's ongoing progress on my GitHub, but it's still very exper experimental, and there are still many challenges, but it's an extremely fun and exciting and uh, you know, interesting problem to work on. Thank you.